everybody, James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. We are really excited to finally welcome you to what we're calling the reboot of the long dormant navigating Netflix series. So our friends at Tragedy and Hope first came up with the idea in 2010, and we actually made a couple of episodes. That would be two episodes together in 2011, but it is still actually a great and active group discussion in the Tragedy and Hope community, and we plan to make this a monthly series from Media Monarchy where each episode features someone from the Tragedy and Hope community where they bring a show or a film, some motion picture, to the table here to discuss, and I thought it just made perfect sense to invite back someone that was on the pilot episode of Navigating Netflix, and where we talked about the experiment, and that is Paul Verge of Divergent Films. Thanks so much for joining us, buddy, on the reboot of Navigating Netflix. Thank you so much for having me back in this inaugural episode. And I'll keep the puns coming. You've elected to talk about House of Cards. Of course, the series on Netflix, the original series on Netflix, original with quotes around it, based on a British show. And it's really, I mean, it is probably one of the most successful sort of original web television shows because it wasn't... They, if you recall, they did Arrested Development, but that had already been a show on Fox. They kind of re revived it in a different form. But House of Cards was created in the U.S. for Netflix originally, and it's been nominated and won a lot of awards and really kind of grabbed people as being a really watchable and kind of important show, I think. And it did really kind of grab people and obviously grabbed you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually didn't watch it until the second season came out. And uh, I had heard about it from many friends just saying, oh, you have to see this political drama. It's basically the most realistic take on American politics ever. And uh, I get a lot of shows hyped to me and don't always have a lot of time to watch TV. But eventually I sat and uh, decided to watch an episode one night. And I ended up binge watching the entire first season until late in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I hadn't heard of the British version that's from 1990. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't aware that there was a trilogy of the British version that uh, was three parts that came out in 1990, 93, and 95. And uh, so I was in, intrigued and wanted to check out even the old British versions. And by that time, the second season came out, so I watched that. And I found it was just... The, the refreshing thing about it is it didn't show that the political class were heroes, like many political dramas do. It actually mm. showed them as these sort of psychopathic parasites. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is really refreshing. This is like, uh, you know, the smashing of the idols, proverbially, and uh, just acted to perfection, directed to perfection. And so really intriguing, really good storylines. And it takes core pieces of the original British version, like it keeps the British arist aristocratic names mm -hmm. like Francis and Claire from mm -hmm. the Leeds, um, but it delves into the American, the... Um, almost like the the coasts versus the Midwest and how that whole, these different regions basically clash and how all these various interests clash. So I thought it was really interesting that, you know, it's examining the idea of power and money and uh, Francis Underwood, the Ke Kevin Spacey's main character, talks about how uh, money is one form of power, but real power is like the influence to make anybody do anything, right? And... It, it's you know more than just money so it's like authority blackmail charming people persuading them using fallacious appeals to convince them or trick them um, or even wielding or manufacturing public opinion so these are all tools that are used throughout the series by different characters to try and get what they need or what they want and uh, and you get to see a lot of the sacrifices that these people make uh, not really good sacrifices but more like mm -hmm. sacrificing sacrificing integrity and morality <laughs> To, uh, to achieve their aims. Um, so I thought one of the most interesting things uh, is right in the title of House of Cards, you see a little American flag, but it's flipped upside down. And I had to look that up, but it, it means the official sign of, or the official signal of distress. So what do you think of that symbology, James? Uh, it's, it's showing you that it is, yeah, it's a nation in distress. I think it's interesting if you kind of compare it to, I just was kind of, picturing the west wing a show like the west wing probably kind of carries itself in perhaps a more realistic manner but it's also trying to present itself with people who are all striving actually to for the most part to do well but they're of course you know fatal flaws that all kind of heroes or false heroes kind of have but ultimately it's all kind of for the greater good and it's kind of a feel good 
makes you feel good about government kind of show. House yeah. of Cards, of course, the complete opposite. And had, I mean, I guess Kevin Spacey makes a fantastic villain. He's sort of an <laughs> eminently watchable bad guy because he's sort of the the glee he takes in being almost like a Mr. Burns type villain. Totally. So you, I think, were looking at just the the characters that populate this area and how they kind of connect to sort of real life archetypes archetypes is, i believe is kind of what you were talking about correct yeah as in like there's the difference between stereotypes and archetypes so stereotypes are usually like the uh the negative and often untrue traits that are ascribed to groups or types of people and then archetypes are more of the more true representative um vision i guess of different groups and competing interests so i uh i did a little grief character analysis a little line or two on a bunch of the main characters that i thought we could describe how the the characters represent an archetype that would exist in the real political landscape let's say um so for instance you've got frank and claire underwood uh and they could remind you in a sense of like a bill clinton hillary clinton Type dynamic where, like, even though in our public society, uh, Hillary Clinton was like the angry wife, Bill Clinton was cheating on her. I think that's actually far more common, like arrangements like that, mm -hmm. uh, than people let on in political circles. And so you get to see that behind the scenes where, um, when Frank is with other women or other people, Claire doesn't get upset about mm -hmm. it. She's like, okay, what? How is this helping us? You know what I mean? She looks at the manipulative angle. It's kind of a business arrangement. Absolutely. A so show business arrangement in a lot of ways. Really, it is. And and it. I like that they kept the idea from the British series where Francis will periodically break the fourth wall and he'll turn to the audience and he'll let them in on his inner thoughts. Um, and sometimes they're very ruthless and you're just like, wow, I can't believe it. It's like, it's like having a psychopath look you in the eyes and tell you, this is what my plan is and here's where my, my machinations are. <laughs> and so, again, you don't see a lot of uh, uh, programs that are doing that that are just like, you know what, I'm going to drop all the pretenses. And you see the juxtaposition between his real intentions versus what he's doing in mid-scene. He's like uh, Zach Morris in Saved by the Bell going, time out, <laughs> and then turning to the audience and saying, actually, I'm about to screw this guy over, but watch watch how masterfully I manipulate this guy. And, and then, re sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and, and that's always, oftentimes in motion picture, that can be a risky move sometimes, because I think critics will look at it and go, oh, well, that's lazy. You need a narrator to kind of tell everything that's going on. But in this situation, it does it does work so perfectly well, and I think the way they kind of make the story it becomes a part of it. I think what starts maybe feeling weird the first couple of times he does it, mm -hmm. you reach the point where you're kind of looking forward to him turning to you and telling another secret, I think. Absolutely, because he's providing clarity usually in those moments, right? And there's still a, it's still a thriller, dramatic aspect to the show, right? You're, it's, it's, it's a really strange dynamic. It's actually worse than Dexter in terms of like your quote-unquote rooting for the bad guy uh -huh. I, I hate to call him a protagonist i just call him the main character um because he's really an antagonist he's really antagonizing everyone else around him to get what he wants mm -hmm. um and so I, I found it's interesting that while on the surface he's a he's a good old boy he's like the southern gentleman but uh in reality he's a you know he's a bisexual hedonist and he's driven by lust for both power and lust for uh domination over others and he almost seems to have a, yeah, like you said, a, a, a smug or a gleefulness in how he's able to play people like instruments. Now, is there, does that mirror a, a sort of real life person on the political stage? I'm sure it mirrors lots of, <laughs> lots of them. But do you have sort of, are there, are there real life people in mind that you kind of compare to them? I, I, I would go back to the Clinton. Uh, that would be the strongest. I, I mean, I think he's the a, a mishmash of a bunch of different personas because um, mm -hmm. I know the creator of the American version was uh, a staffer there you go. for political campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's definitely seen more than the public would have and would have a greater idea of just how, for lack of a better term, slimy some of these situations can get um, or greasy or weaselly. Um, <laughs> and so you kind of like fear that your representatives that you're handing over power to or, or apparently voting for in a social contract that they would actually have your best interest at heart but they really just have their own selfish interests at heart and 
the fact of the series is that Kevin Spacey's Frank Underwood is driven, he's driven by uh, ambition and the lust for power, but the spark that motivates him at the beginning is actually revenge against uh, this, this president at the beginning of the series who he thought was promised uh, a special post in cabinet and he doesn't get it, so he decides to, okay, I'm going to plot against my, my own president. And well, and you really get to see this kind of two-facedness where he's you know, moving pieces into place and sometimes you even think that he's uh, not thought things through or that he's le left uh, an idea um, unattended when all of a sudden it's like, oh, that was all part of my master stroke. Or, you know what I mean? And so you're just like, wow, how deep does the manipulation go? And it, so it's, it almost gives you this sense of um, anxiety because you're like, wow, could, could real politicians be such master spinning spinster manipulators? And unfortunately, the truth is, is yes, like they have teams. And so getting into these other characters, mm -hmm. you have these teams of people that help uh, support and ask for support from the Underwoods. Um, so to touch briefly on Robin Wright's character, Claire Underwood, she, you could say she's sort of a Hillary Clinton type, but more plays up um, her femininity, I guess you could say. Uh, but it, she appears to use women's issues and progressive issues for her own agenda. So she's mm -hmm. got her own tax exempt foundation and she still has a desire for power, like wanting to become an ambassador, um, even though she doesn't have the qualifications. And uh, I found in the third season, I'm not sure if you've seen it yet, but there starts to be a real wedge between Frank's and Claire's ambitions mm -hmm. that starts to actually, she starts to get more clarity about just how much uh, their footing is not equal because she's usually operating under the pretense that her and Francis are on equal footing and that everything he's doing is for them. But she starts to realize it's more about him versus them. I like so. the connections between Claire and Clarity, and of course, the, you know the names. The names always mean something. Playwrights and writers don't just pull names out of the out of the woodwork. They're usually they kind of there's there's a spark there that always kind of means something. I know people have kind of talked about the predictive programming, the connections, because we basically I think the fourth season of House of Cards will come out this coming February in 2016. Mm -hmm. By that point, the presidential selections here in the states will be in even more kind of full swing so is there some element of kind of a hillary predictive bit going on in house of cards yeah i actually believe not only in terms of injecting some of these ideas but for contemporary politics and some of the things that are going on it's there's definitely the undertones or the, the subtext of setting up like a head-to-head -head male female presidential battle if you want to call mm -hmm. it that because um, we've been primed for the last 10 years with all the all the um, divide and conquer over gender issues mm -hmm. to really get people to take side on something as shallow as gender right that, that really has no bearing on like good ideas and all those uh -huh. other things right it's a real it's it's another divisive issue like race or cultural or any of these 